and he's going to he's going to talk about the hazard dimension of Julia sets of meromorphic functions in the Spicer class. Please, Walter. Uh, okay, so thank you very much. Well, first of all, thanks uh, well for the invitation to this conference. So I regret that I cannot be uh, there in person. In particular, since also on the picture I see you uh, have seemed to have a new lecture room, which I have not seen uh, yet. Uh, but uh, anyway, so I uh, hope to be there again, uh, uh, not too far in the future, perhaps. Uh, but <clears throat> this time I have to give this talk uh, online. So I will talk about some joint work with uh, Weiwei Sui. And uh, this is about house of dimension of Julia sets of functions in the Speiser class. And uh, well, actually on the picture here, uh, uh, on the first page, you see a Julia set of particular function. I do not know what the dimension of this Julia set is, but, uh, and the picture is mainly there to look nice, but uh, this function is actually related to the functions that we are, will be considering uh, uh, later on. Okay, so um, uh, well, let me start with uh, the basic definitions, which uh, uh, of course have been there in previous talks and which uh, most of, or all of you uh, probably know, but uh, uh, let me briefly summarize them anyway. So we are considering functions uh, meromorphic in the whole plane, so from the complex plane to the Riemann sphere, and we shall always assume that this is a transcendental meromorphic function. And then we consider the iterates fn, which is f of f of fn times, and one should note that uh, uh, these iterates uh, um, usually will not be defined in the whole complex plane, because uh, if you are mapped to infinity by some iterate, well, at the uh, at infinity, the function is not defined. So the next iterate will not be defined. So uh, the uh, domains of these functions Fn usually will get smaller and smaller. And now the FAT2 set then is a set where, well, as usual, the iterates uh, form a normal family, but here you actually have to ask for more, you have to ask that the iterates are defined and form a normal family in some neighborhood of uh, this point. So uh, this is a Fatou set. And the Julia set is a complement of the Fatou set. Uh, it does not matter here uh, uh, whether you take the complement with respect to the plane or the Riemann sphere. Well, there are other questions, for example, when you talk about connectivity and such questions, there it does matter. But if you talk about host of dimension, as we will do, then it does not matter. And if you add the one point or not. Then we have also uh, already seen that the critical values play uh, uh, an important role. And we say that a value W uh, in the Riemann sphere, we call this a critical value if there is a point xi such that f of xi equals w, and f is not injective in any neighborhood of xi. So if w is not the point at infinity, then this just means that f prime of xi is zero. So you have f prime of xi is zero and f of xi is w. And this xi is then called the critical point. But we also allow that W is a point at infinity. So in this case, you just have a multiple pole. So then we also have the, the asymptotic value. So W is an asymptotic value if there is a curve gamma tending to infinity, such that F tends to W if you go to infinity uh, along that curve uh, gamma. So, and why uh, did we consider singular uh, the, the asymptotic values and the critical values? Well, together they form the set of uh, singularities of the inverse function. And uh, well, and the singularities of the inverse functions, they 
play a, a, a crucial role in uh, complex dynamics. This is also something you uh, surely know and have seen in previous talks. So uh, again, something we have seen in uh, previous talks is the yeramenko lubitsch class. So this is a class of all uh, functions f for which the set of singularities or more precisely the set of finite singularities is bounded. So uh, uh, we don't care here whether infinity is an asymptotic value or a critical value. So we only look at the singularities of the inverse, which are in C. And if this set is bounded, then, well, the set of uh, these functions is called the yeramenko lubitsch class and denoted by B. And uh, the subset is a set of uh, functions where the uh, singularities of the inverse form a finite set. And this is the Speiser class. Uh, denoted uh, or named after Andreas Speiser, who considered them first in a different context. Um, in, yeah. And more precisely, if uh, the singularities of the inverse, if this set has Q elements, then uh, uh, we say that F is in SQ. So uh, the first observation is that if you look at S1, so this is an empty set, you always need to have at least two singularities of the inverse uh, function if uh, you want your function F to be transcendental. And uh, if you consider the set of functions with, with the inverse as two singularities, this can also be uh, determined. Uh, well, if you place the function, the singularities at zero and infinity, so uh, then essentially your function is the exponential function and the inverse function is the logarithm. Well, and uh, if uh, the singularities of the inverse are at some other points, well, then it can be obtained from the exponential function by some Möbius transformation. This is also something uh, uh, Weiwei mentioned yesterday already. So then your function has a form M of exponential of L where M is a fractional linear transformation and L is uh, linear. So uh, your, uh, the Speiser class S is just a union of these uh, uh, classes SQ. Uh, and uh, well, and this is a subset of the Yeromenko uh, Lubitsch class. There are also examples, something like sine z over z. This is a function which is in the Yeromenko Lubitsch class, but uh, which is not in the Speiser class. So it has infinitely many uh, critical values, but these critical values form bounded set. So let me now turn to the Hausdorff dimension. Uh, so I, uh, we denote the Hausdorff dimension of a set A, subset A of the plane by dim of A. So this is a Hausdorff dimension. And I wanna recall now a number of results about uh, the uh, Hausdorff dimension of uh, Julia sets. Well, the first result uh, I want to recall is a result by Baker from 1975. So Baker uh, proved that if F is entire, then the Julia set contains continua. Uh, uh, well, and this of course implies uh, if the uh, uh, Julia set contains a continuum, then its dimension is at least one. Well, Baker was not interested in, uh, well, at least in, the, uh, in that paper, was not interested in uh, Hausdorff dimension. Uh, so he proved this in a different context. Uh, uh, he uh, was interested in wandering domains and he uh, uh, proved that if you have a multiply connected uh, uh, component of the Fatou set, then this is a wandering domain. And for this, he proved on the one hand, this is easy, that if you have a multiply connected domains, then the iterates tend to infinity there. But, and this was his contribution, he also proved 
uh, that if you have a multiply connected domain, then uh, uh, this domain is bounded. And this implies that the Julia set must contain continuum. So the dimension is at least one. Uh, Gwyneth Stallard in uh, uh, 1991 then proved that dimension can be as close to one as you like. So for every positive delta, there is an entire function such that the dimension of the Julia set is less than one plus delta. So, um, well, she only stated this, that there is an entire function, I think, but it turns out that the entire functions that she constructed are actually uh, in the yermenko Lubitsch class B. So uh, uh, it is greater or equal to one, and it can be arbitrarily close to one, well, can it be equal to one? And this was uh, uh, answered much later and quite recently by Chris Bishop. He constructed <clears throat> a transcendental entire function such that the dimension of the Julia set is equal to one. Well, his function uh, 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 was not in the yeromenko lubitsch class. And there is a very good reason why it was not in the yeromenko lubitsch class. Namely, when Stellar had proved before that if you have an entire function in the yeromenko lubitsch class, then the Hausdorff dimension of the Julia set is strictly bigger than one. So, and uh, she also proved later then that uh, for functions in the yeromenko lubitsch class, the dimension of the Julia set actually can take any value uh, between one and uh, two. So in the yeromenko lubitsch class, the dimension is uh, bigger than one, and but every value be bigger than one and less equal to two, of course, is possible. So this gives a complete picture of what the um, possible values of the dimension of the Julia set are for entire functions and also for entire functions in the yermenko lubitsch class. Uh, now, uh, uh, Chris uh, Bishop and Simon Albrecht considered the question, what uh, can you uh, say or for functions in the Speiser class? So, and what they did, they, showed that uh, the result by Gwyneth Stellard from 1991 also holds in the Speiser class. So they proved that for every delta, there is a function f in the Speiser class, which is entire, so that the dimension is of the Julia set is less than one plus delta. So the dimension of the Julia set can be arbitrarily close to one not only in the yeromenko lubitsch class, but also in the Speiser class. And if you do a count, then you uh, find that there are functions actually the, the inverse has uh, four singularities. Uh, one should note here that we always include infinity in uh, uh, the set of singularities of the inverse. So for an entire function, infinity is always an asymptotic value. Uh, so this is Everson's theorem. And uh, so uh, this would mean that the function they constructed has uh, three finite, the inverse has three finite uh, singularities. So let's now turn to uh, meromorphic uh, functions. So uh, again, here, the first result uh, is due to uh, Gwyneth Stallard. She proved that for um, transcendental meromorphic function, the uh, Julia set uh, has positive dimension. So the dimension of the Julia set is strictly bigger than zero. And uh, similar uh, to the case for entire function, she also showed that this restriction is the only one. So uh, for every given D greater than zero and less or equal to two, there is a meromorphic function 
so that's a junior uh, that's that's a julia set has this given dimension and uh, this function can also be chosen to be in the euromanko lubitsch class okay and so the question that we considered now is uh, uh, can you do the this also in the speiser class and the answer is yes uh, so this is a theorem our theorem for every d there is a function in the speiser class such that the dimension of the julia set is equal to d and it actually turns out that this function as uh, for, the, for this function, the inverse has only three singularities. Well, uh, about three singularities, you can of course ask, uh, can't you do with uh, fewer singularities, namely two, but we had seen already that uh, functions with two singularities are of the form uh, fractional linear transformation of exponential of some linear function. And uh, for those functions, uh, Joseph Baranski had uh, already shown that the dimension of the Julia set is always bigger than one half. Actually, he had shown more about these functions. For example, the functions lambda tangent z are uh, in this class S2. And uh, there, if lambda tends from zero to one, he, he showed that then the dimension of the Julia set increases from one half to one. So uh, certainly the interval from one half to one is already covered by these functions in S2. And so, or put it differently, I think the main interest of our theorem then would be the case where D is less or equal to one half. Okay, so let me now say something uh, uh, about the proof. So some ideas of the proof, or maybe if there are questions before the proofs about these statements, well, this is a good uh, time to ask, but uh, in any case, you can always interrupt me and ask uh, a question. Okay, so in the proof, we will consider also the escaping set. Well, it, I should perhaps say we will, it does not really, it does perhaps not explicitly uh, appear in the proof, but uh, somehow implicitly it does. And the escaping set is a set of all points which tend to infinity under iteration. And well, this was for entire functions introduced by Alex Yeramenko in 1986. And um, he proved that this was perhaps the main thing that this escaping set is non empty. And then it follows that the boundary of the escaping set is a Julia set. For meromorphic functions, this, this was done by Patricia Dominguez. Uh, who, however, also had a new proof of this result for entire functions. Uh, well, and if you are in the Yeromenko Lubitsch class, then uh, the escaping set is a subset of the Julia set. This was uh, proven by Yeromenko and Lubitsch, uh, well, in the uh, a paper where they introduced this uh, uh, Yermenko Lubitsch class and uh, studied the dynamics of functions in this class. And this was, uh, well, and certainly an important result there. And this was extended then to uh, meromorphic functions by uh, Phil Rippon and Gwyneth Stallard. So, what we will do is we will construct a function f. First, so we will construct a function f, which is in the Speiser class, or more precisely in this class S3, where the dimension of the escaping set is zero, but the dimension of the Julia set is large. And then we will consider these functions f lambda of z, which are f of lambda z. Well, it doesn't matter whether you consider f of lambda z 
for lambda times f of z. So these functions are conjugate to each other. Anyway, we will consider this function. And uh, then we will prove uh, two things. The first thing is that if lambda tends to zero, then the Julia set of this function, uh, uh, the dimension of the Julia set of f lambda tends to uh, zero. Well, and uh, why zero? Well, this is the uh, uh, connection to the uh, escaping set here. So, uh, well, as I said, it doesn't maybe doesn't show in the statement, but somehow uh, when you look at the proof, why do you get zero as a limit of the dimension of the Julia set? Get zero because this is the dimension of the escaping set. And the second thing we will prove is that uh, the dimension of uh, J of F lambda depends continuously on lambda. And now you see, so if uh, lambda is one, then F lambda is F, you have a large dimension. And if uh, uh, lambda tends to zero, this dimension tends to zero. So uh, because it's continuous, it uh, covers all the values in between. So we, you start with a large dimension and for small lambda, you have a small dimension and everything in between is covered. So um, how do we construct this function f? We start with an even elliptic function, which has periods pi and pi i. So a doubly periodic function with these two periods. And we assume that the function is real on the real axis. And uh, also that it is real. Well, maybe I, I should briefly draw this. So, uh, uh, oops. So here is, uh, minus pi over two here is pi over two. So, and then the function should be real on the real axis here, but it should also be real on this vertical line I'm drawing here now. And because it is as period pi, if it is real here, then it is also real there. So uh, this is uh, what, uh, he asked for. So we are looking for an elliptic function with this property. I will show you in a minute how you actually can get such an elliptic function. And what you also perhaps see if the function is uh, uh, real on the real axis, but also real on this vertical line, uh, the only way sort of you can achieve this is that it has a, a critical value at this. Uh, uh, points pi over two and uh, minus pi over two. But let me also sort of uh, explicitly uh, uh, ask for that. So as I said, it uh, uh, actually follows from what we had before, but uh, uh, let's also write it down here. So, and uh, what we then do is we say that the function G of arc sine, that this is a, function which is meromorphic in the plane. Well, why is this so? Look at what does the arc sign do? The arc sign maps the upper half plane onto this half strip, which I uh, uh, drawn here on the right hand side. So, and now I have asked that the function capital G is a real, on the boundary of this half strip. So if I take the function little f, which is capital G of arc sine, what happens? This function is defined in the upper half plane and is real on the real axis. So we have a function uh, defined in the upper half plane, it extends to the real axis and is real there. So by Schwartz reflection principle, you can extend this function to a function which is uh, uh, meromorphic uh, in the whole plane. So, uh, uh, and uh, we will work with this function f. So I should say that uh, 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 this is not a new idea. This functions have 
uh, such functions have considered uh, have been considered by various other people before. I think the first one was Teichmüller, who considered this already in 1944. But then later, Bank and Kaufmann and also uh, Langley they considered this in the context of complex differential equations, and also uh, Yeromenko considered such functions. So, uh, and this is, uh, so to say, one building block for our uh, uh, construction. So, well, how do we get such a function G? So one way is to choose this as a conformal map, map from a triangle onto the lower half plane. So let me uh, show you a picture. So you have this triangle uh, and uh, you map this triangle to the upper, uh, uh, to the lower half plane, and uh, uh, the uh, corners are mapped in the way shown here. So uh, the red dot uh, zero goes to this uh, red dot on the right hand side, which is one. As uh, the blue one at uh, uh, what is pi over two goes to zero. And the green one at uh, i pi over two, well, this goes to infinity and uh, well, uh, somehow I cannot draw infinity uh, uh, on the right hand side, but anyway. And now you uh, uh, continue this function and you reflect. So uh, you reflect at this long side of the triangle and this is the reflection as mapped to the upper half plane, then you reflect at the left side of this triangle and then you reflect again and reflect again and so forth. You can always uh, uh, reflect and uh, uh, alternating a map to upper or lower half plane and uh, well and uh, finally now you have a, a square of side lengths pi and uh, this is sort of, how do you call this sort of a fundamental square or fundamental parallelogram for this elliptic function. So the function you uh, construct, uh, you obtain when you uh, continue reflecting and reflecting is periodic with periods pi and i pi. Well, this function uh, uh, is an elliptic function, which implies it has no asymptotic values. And what are the uh, critical values? The critical values are just the values uh, taken at the corners of this triangle. And this, these are the values 0, 1, and infinity. Well, then uh, uh, what follows? We have this function g, so this elliptic function is an S3. Now we take f, which is g of arc sine. This is also in S3, so it has the same three critical values. And well, if you want, you may also express this function in terms of the Weierstrass p function. And well, I'm not going through uh, this. Uh, consideration now, but if you think about it for a while, then uh, you find that the uh, function G can be expressed in terms of Weierstrass P function in the way it is written here. Well, <clears throat> now what is the growth of this function? Well, I'm uh, uh, right down here, what's the never linear characteristic is, uh, you well, you don't really need to know what the never linear characteristic is. So the never linear characteristic uh, tells you something about the growth of the function. But for the kind of functions we are considering, essentially all that matters is uh, what is the number of poles. And essentially, this statement here says if uh, uh, n r f is the number of poles in the circle with radius r, then the number of poles, 
sort of grow something like uh, some constant times logarithm of r as r tends to infinity. So this is a, essentially this statement. And um, uh, there is also another statement um, uh, uh, about the order. What is the order? You say um, uh, 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 fs finite order uh, if uh, so uh, there exists uh, say a constant mu say uh, with a property uh, such that uh, well, and now you can TRF is less than R to the mu or what is, for our functions here, this is equivalent the number of poles is less than R to the mu for all large R. And uh, 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 the order is then the in femum of such mu. So the smallest mu with this property, this is what is called uh, the order. And here you see uh, there is something like log r or log r squared. This grows slower than any power of mu. So uh, the order is here zero. And this is, uh, this function has order zero. And now there is a result by Janina Kotos and myself. So we prove that if a function f in the yeromenko lubitsch class has finite order, if infinity is not an asymptotic value, and if there is a uniform bound m on the multiplicity of the poles, then the dimension of the escaping set is can be bounded in terms of m and rho. It does not really matter here what the uh, exact bound is. The point is only if the order is rho, then uh, uh, the right hand side is zero. So the dimension of the escaping set is zero. So uh, uh, I should perhaps uh, say there are further developments here. So there is a recent paper of Meyer and Volker Meyer and Marius Urbanski, who sort of identify the um, sort of the exact value of this uh, of the dimension of the escaping set. So in many cases, but it uh, uh, is not really needed here. But in any case, the important thing is what we obtain is that the dimension of the escaping set is zero for this function. And if you look at the proof of this result, then uh, it actually shows that not only the dimension of the escaping set is zero, but if you look at the functions f lambda, which is f of lambda z, then the dimension of this Julia sets of f lambda also tends to zero. So this is why I say there is a connection to the uh, uh, escaping uh, set. So uh, now uh, we want to know something about the dimension of Julia sets and uh, the function f we are considering is made up from an elliptic function and arc sine. So let us first look at dimension of Julia sets of elliptic function. And there we are in the lucky situation that this question has been considered before by Janina Kotos and Marius Urbanski. And they show that if Q is a maximal multiplicity of the Julia set of an elliptic function, then the dimension is bigger than 2q over q plus one. Just for comparison, let me show you a more recent result by Janina Kotos. Well, and now uh, I probably have a pronunciation uh, 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 problem. <laughs> Galas, well, there are enough polls to help me, uh, <laughs> the audience, maybe even the uh, Janina's co-author, I don't know. But anyway, 
uh, uh, they prove uh, uh, that. Huh? So what did you say? Uh, okay, so. Uh, uh, so they prove that the dimension of the escaping set is two Q over Q plus one. So, and the dimension of the Julia set is strictly bigger than that. So, mm -hmm. so this is a, uh, uh, a connection. And well, we, I also mentioned that the escaping set for functions uh, in this class is contained in the Julia set. So the uh, dimension of the Julia set must be greater or equal, but in this case, it is actually strictly great. So what we will do now, instead of the function G of arc sine, we will do two things. First, we will multiply, uh, uh, we will take a power of G, we will take G to some power P, right? Well, we want to increase the dimension of the Julia set. So in order to achieve this, we have to increase the multiplicity of the poles. And this we just do by taking a power. And then well, we will multiply this by some constant eta. And then we also modify this arc sign a little bit. So uh, this, what can we say about uh, this function eta times g to the power p? So the poles have multiplicity for p. So the dimension of this is uh, 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 eight is bigger than eight p divided by four p plus one. And now I claim that uh, for the function f we also get this. Well, note that uh, this here tends to. Uh, uh, arc sine of z. So uh, as m tends to infinity, so uh, 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 the, the whole function tends to eta, uh, uh, not, not, sorry, not arc sine. Uh, this tends to z as m tends to infinity. So this tends to eta times g of z to the power p. And well, now I'm not using here anything that the dimension uh, uh, that of the Julia set is continuous or something like that. But uh, because this function f tends to this elliptic function as m tends to infinity, sort of the same argument to prove the bound for the dimension of the uh, uh, Julia set of the elliptic function gives you that the dimension of uh, uh, the Julia set of F uh, satisfies the same lower bound. So what we can achieve is that the dimension of the Julia set of F is close to one or as close to one, uh, so close to two, as close to two as we want. So uh, let me now, well, uh, come to the second part, which was continuity of the dimension. Well, one thing to observe is uh, if, that if you take this constant eta, so maybe go back here. So uh, our, we had this elliptic function and multiplied it by some constant eta. And one thing to observe is that if you take this eta sufficiently small, then we can achieve that the Julia set is totally disconnected. Maybe I don't want to say uh, much about uh, uh, this. So what you have to do is you have to make sure that all uh, uh, singularities of the inverse are in some, uh, some attracting basin. So the lemma is the following. Suppose you have an attracting fixed point uh, and the attracting basin contains all finite singularities of the inverse. Well, then there is also some, the assumption that infinity is not an asymptotic value. And also as in this result I had with Janina Koto said there is a uniform bound on the multiplicities of the poles. 
Well, then the Julia set is totally disconnected and the Fatou set consists of this attracting base set. Well, this is uh, also uh, not new, so to say. Uh, well, or more precisely, we didn't find the statement in exactly this form in the literature, but uh, there are very closely related results by Baker, Dominguez, and Jang. And actually, we can also achieve uh, that there is some uniformity in this uh, with respect to lambda. So that for all the functions uh, f lambda, the Julia set is totally disconnected, and that the Fatou set is the attracting basin. Uh, of some attracting fixed point. So, uh, uh, well, I have here uh, 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 the picture of some Julia sets. So uh, the, on the left, this is uh, uh, the, uh, you saw on the first page, this of, is of this function G of arc sine of Z. So where G is this elliptic function I uh, showed you. And you see there the Julia said there are actually two attracting fixed points, the basins drawn in yellow and red. So this is not uh, totally disconnected, but uh, if you multiply this with one half, so this eta would be one half here, then you see it uh, is totally disconnected. So this is a picture in the middle. And actually, uh, uh, also, if you now multiply by some lambda less than one, so uh, the dimension of the Julia set could, should get smaller. And uh, well, at least on the picture, it looks like as if the Julia set would indeed get somewhat thinner if this lambda gets small. So uh, now, how do you prove the continuity? Uh, well, let M lambda be the multiplier of this attracting fixed point Xi lambda. And it is sort of some, uh, uh, well, this fixed point will be on the real axis. The function is real on the real axis. The multiplier is real. And if you just look at the graph of the function, you find the multiplier is positive. And you can also achieve that this multiplier uh, is a monotone function of lambda. So this is uh, uh, really some calculus estimates for this function. So this is a monotone continuous function. And now, if you have an attracting fixed point, uh, with some multiplier, there is a standard uh, uh, procedure where by quasi-conformal conjugation, you can change the modulus of this uh, uh, multiplier. So uh, well, the, if A and B are uh, less than one, then the function AZ is quasi-conformally conjugate to so the function BZ, and you can use this so sort of to conjugate uh, your function f lambda to a function which has another multiplier, a fixed point with another, attracting fixed point with another multiplier. So now let psi be the map which changes the multiplier of f lambda to the multiplier m kappa, which is a multiplier of f kappa. So there, you can do this by some quasi-conformal deformation, but you know already another function which has the multiplier m kappa. This is a function f kappa. And what we uh, then show is that uh, the function g obtained by the quasi-conformal modification is indeed the function f kappa. And we don't really have to show this because it has been shown already by others, say for Yeremenk, for entire functions, uh, uh, this is a lemma uh, uh, by Yeremenko Lubitsch, or for meromorphic functions, it was also well uh, uh, observed and also explicitly stated by Epstein and uh, Rempe. So the statement is 
if you have two functions f and g in this Speiser class S3, and suppose that there are homeomorphisms psi and phi such that psi of f is g of phi, well, then uh, there is a fractional linear transformation alpha and then a fine map beta such that alpha of f is g of beta. Well, and the idea here is simply you uh, 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 sort of move your uh, the map psi. This is isotopic to some fractional linear transformation alpha. So you uh, uh, move your psi to this alpha and uh, by this isotopy, and then the phi becomes, uh, has to become holomorphic map, so a phi map beta. Well, and uh, so what have we seen? We have this quasi conformal map psi and uh, uh, f kappa now can be written as psi of f lambda of psi inverse. We also know what the dilatation of this k is. So the, well, uh, it is essentially the dilatation of this map if you uh, change az to bz by a quasi-conformal map. What is a quasi-conformal map? This quasi-conformal map is of the form z maps to z times some power of mod z. You can compute uh, the dilatation of that map. And what you find is that this is the maximum of log m kappa over log m lambda and the inverse of that. So uh, uh, what you see is, well, the, you should all the next thing, quasi-conformal maps are Hölder continuous. And the exponent of Hölder continuity is just this dilatation. So the dilatation tends to one if kappa tends to lambda. And this uh, then shows that the dimension of F, the Julia set of F kappa, which is between one over K times the dimension of F lambda and K times the dimension of J of F lambda. So if kappa tends to a lambda, then K tends to one. So the dimension of J of F kappa tends to that of J of F lambda. And uh, what you find is, that the dimension of the Julia set of F lambda is a continuous function of, lam of lambda. So, and this was the last uh, thing we uh, wanted to prove. So this finishes the proof and uh, what remains is to thank you very much for your attention. So thanks. Thank you. Um, are there any questions for Walter? Or from the online um, participants? I, I can ask some questions. Um, uh, Walter, um, so you show that you have a function of every dimension between zero and two for the Julia set. Yeah. Um, and where we were talking about dimensions of the escaping sets yeah. as well. So uh, I guess um, in terms of getting the dimension of the escaping set with three, uh, with three singular values, have you thought about that? Well, we, are, we uh, uh, I think you asked the same question yes. to, uh, to Weiwei yesterday. I thought he said, wait uh, for your talk. So I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no. And, uh, uh, well, and uh, well, as Weiwei said, sort of, we are uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, thinking of that. And I think we uh, 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 are already. Uh, sort of pretty far, maybe not finished, but uh, pretty far there, yeah. So I wait for the next conference. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> so in, in your proof with the continuity of the house of dimension, I guess um, you are always in the space of, of attraction. So uh, would, you ex would you expect this house of dimension to actually vary somehow real analytically as usually in these, in these circumstances? I guess. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I think so, yes. Yeah. But I... I uh, but you only uh, need continuity, so you don't really care. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, but but it should probably yes. Yeah. So so maybe the final one is so I guess 
technically speaking, you might, you'd probably expect, so you take different functions in order to, uh, which have a big, um, well, yeah, big dimension of the Julia set um, by this previous result. And then you get the dimension to go all the way down to zero within, yeah. within that kind of um, basin of, uh, uh, within that hyperbolic component. So uh, you'd probably expect that you can get arbitrarily close to two as well within the hyperbolic component, but that would probably be harder to justify rigorously. Just if you go to the boundary, yeah, yeah, you yeah. kind of expect this, the dimension uh, to, to get arbitrarily yeah. close to two. Uh, uh, actually, I also, um, well, maybe not, uh, uh, didn't spend uh, too much time on it, but uh, I, I uh, well, we are working in this class as, three so you could uh, well uh, you could, and i said what happens if you work in s2 so these are these functions uh, a fractional linear transformation of exponential functions so something like tangent or whatever and uh, uh, I uh, said already that uh, just of baranski showed that uh, between that you get every uh, dimension between one half and one within this class, also with some uh, totally disconnected uh, uh, Julia sets, of course. Uh, you could ask what kind of dimensions can you get in this uh, uh, class? So uh, in particular, also you could ask, can you get every dimension between one and two in this class already? And uh, uh, the answer is, <laughs> I don't know, uh, but- uh, But probably. Uh, pro uh, well, I would, be, I would be surprised if you could not get any dimension between one and two in this class, if there was, uh, some reason why you cannot get dimension 1.7 in this class or so, I would be very surprised, but uh, uh, I don't have a, a sort of, I don't have a proof of uh, that you can get every dimension, but I must say I also have not uh, thought too much about it. So. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions or comments? Uh, uh, have you thought uh, about uh, how sort of dimension of radial Julia set in this for, for this family? Uh, because no, I... uh, well, uh, we we know that uh, it is the zero of the pressure. Yes, in, mm -hmm. in this uh, case of class S, is it equal or not? Well, I, I think the uh, short answer is I have not thought about it. <laughs> so I cannot really say anything about it. So, uh, well, we could do some speculation, but maybe better I shouldn't. I, I think it should be equal because these functions are hyperbolic and the poles have bounded multiplicity. Mm -hmm. So the set of points where you have bounded um, a, a bounded amount of branching, I think that's that's exactly the uh, the Julia set, um, and then normally the um, I, th I think there's an argument uh, th that uh, the mm -hmm. radial Julia set should have the same dimension. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again. Well, thank you.